hard work, luck, hire the right people. He's been a part of many, many high tech companies, two with multi billion dollar valuations, seven really high tech companies now taking a bet on this token space, really taking advantage of the stick that was applied specifically to European banks with a deadline coming up in six months called PSD2. His token approach allows banks to basically not only monetize API calls, but really bring themselves into the 21st century. He also obviously makes a cut of that. The more banks that use them, the more API calls, the more money he makes. They raised uh, over $15 million, team of 20 folks between San Francisco and London. Four or five banks integrated so far. That number is increasing rapidly, rapidly though, as European banks looks to comply with these new laws. This is The Top, where I interview entrepreneurs who are number one or number two in their industry in terms of revenue or customer base. You'll learn how much revenue they're making, what their marketing funnel looks like, and how many customers they have. I'm now at $20,000 per top. Five and six million. He is hell-bent on global domination. We just broke our 100,000 unit soul mark. And I'm your host, Nathan Latka. This is episode 763. Coming up tomorrow morning, you're going to learn from crypto thought leader Jack Peterson. He's raised a lot of money, $5.3 in his initial token offering on the Ethereum blockchain to help you bet on future events. Hello, everybody. My guest today is Steve Kirsch. He's the CEO of a company called Token, a Silicon Valley startup company developing a modern platform for open banking. He's pioneered several core computer technologies like optical mouse, internet search, span filtering, and secure identity, and founded seven high-tech companies, two with billion-dollar market caps. Those are InfoSeq and Frame Technology. He received his BS and MS in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT in 1980. Steve, are you ready to take us to the top? I am. You were doing this before I was born, so I can't wait for this. How does tell us what token is and what the what the business model is? How do you make money? So what we do is supply open banking software to banks. So I'm kind of like the Bill Gates of um, for for banks. So just like Bill saw computers, they needed an operating system for people to use them. Uh, banks have the same problem. There's no real API that works across all banks. And so what we do is we go to a bank, give them our software, and um, uh, they, it, you know, it's, it's very similar to me going to a hardware manufacturer and saying, hey, here's an operating system you can run on your hardware. In this case, it's going to banks saying, here's some open API a banking software you can run on your bank so that anybody uh, any developer can access the bank uh, in a secure way. And give me an example of a bank that's using this and how they're using it, a real life example. So we have it live with Fedor Bank today. The problem is that most banks don't have an open API where you can do things like move money, um, uh, but Fedor did. Mm -hmm. And so we um, uh, got access to their API. Uh, we hooked it up to our system. And so now you can use our APIs to drive the APIs of Fedor. And as we add more and more banks, um, you'll be able to use the same APIs across all banks. So it's going to make interacting with the financial system much easier for developers, something we've never had before in history, because banks have always been uh, very close to uh, um, to APIs, so yeah, they've so been like, super open to, 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 to people, but not to uh, not to, not to apps. I mean, how do you get? Oh, I imagine the initial question on this thing we're trying to sell it into is security, right? I mean, how, why or how can you convince them? How do you convince them to to adopt you? The uh, uh, the banks, um, it's actually more secure to adopt us than. Uh, to do it themselves and uh, open it up uh, to these regulated third parties. And the reason is we spent a lot of time creating an end-to-end -end secure um, uh, architecture that's based on uh, digital cryptography and there are no shared secrets. And so it's very, very difficult for somebody to spoof the system and to authorize something because basically it's signed by the user's, uh, uh, it, by the hardware in the user's cell phone. And that digital signature is then verified at the far end by the bank. Okay. And so there's nothing that can be done in between to tamper with the transaction. Whereas most banks are using, for their own APIs, they're using OAuth 2, which is 
just horrible from a security perspective. Steve, does this have elements of, I mean, what we're seeing take off right now in crypto? I mean, are there blockchain elements built into this? Uh, we have a shared ledger that we use for instant payment capability uh, that we're developing. And that does not use, um, when people refer to blockchain, typically they're talking about Byzantine fault tolerance uh, uh, type of consensus. Uh, there's no real need for that uh, in a lot of financial applications. Uh, and for something that needs to perform really quickly, uh, meaning super low latency uh, and very high throughput, uh, the technology for blockchain is just not appropriate because you just don't have it's the time slow. to get consensus. It's very, very yeah, slow. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, the Bank of England uh, did a, a, an experiment with Ethereum, and they found that they could get uh, like five transactions a second. You know, because the problem is that when you make a transaction out of your central bank account, that it better finalize, which means it's got to talk to all the parties before it can say, okay, great, we're a consensus next. Yep. And until that happens, it's not going to accept the, the, the next transaction because yep. it has to have a consistent view. Of, of the world. And take me back to the backstory here. So what year did you launch this company in? Uh, we launched the company a couple of years ago. So, so what, like 2014? Wait, um, <laughs> the 2015. 20, why yeah. do you, why well, do you, it, 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 why it do you was, laugh? It was, yeah, it was late, uh, late, late 2014. It was like October, 2014. I get the sense there's like a good story there based off your facial reaction. Uh, no, no. no. Come I mean, on. Just, uh, what is it, Steve? What happened? No, no, no you can't. Did you spin, <laughs> did you spin it? I mean, did you spin it out of something or? Uh, no, no. I mean, it started as a, hey, let's, um, you know, banks are really behind the times. It would be great to bring uh, Bitcoin-like technology to banks. Uh, and so we started approaching banks with, hey, you know, here's an upgrade to your technology and, wouldn't this be cool? And they said, yeah, come back later when you have 100 banks on it and we'll, uh, we'll take a look at it. Yep. And what is, uh, have you decided to bootstrap this or have you raised capital? Uh, we raised a Series A $18.5 million um, for the company. And, uh, uh, but it was done after we heard about this legislation in Europe called PSD2. And PSD2 requires all the banks to open up their APIs. So we come in and say, hey, look, you know, we've designed a secure architecture um, and it works beautifully with uh, uh, compliance with PSD2. So we saw it as a compliance solution uh, to banks and also as a revenue enhancement because we have ways to charge the callers for API calls so you can monetize your API calls. So now that the European Commission has forced you to open up your bank, um, token is a way for banks to monetize those transactions. And, and so, yeah, I wanted to learn more about your revenue model. Do you make money off that same utility metric, API calls processed like per some amount of time? Yeah, so we charge for API calls and we basically get those calls typically for free from the bank. And so we make money on the difference. Why, why is between, that so fun? Making free. money is a beautiful <laughs> thing. Yes. Why, why yeah, do you we buy? We buy low, sell high, just like anybody else. <laughs> I hope you guys so, are. I hope you guys uh, are watching. Buy, yeah, buy the transaction from the bank, and uh, and then we sell it to the um, uh, to developers at a uh, somewhat higher price. Yeah. So this is, and, and are we are we talking a flat fee per API call or a per percentage of the value attached to the API call? It depends on what the API call is. Uh, typically, it'll be a flat fee, but it also could be basis points. Okay, and are we talking? No, in, are we talking yeah, right. in terms of cents or less than a cent? Um, we're probably talking uh, on the order of cents. Cents, okay. Maybe and a couple cents. For people listening right now that don't have a technology background, I want to see if I can present a story and you tell me if you can confirm that this is exactly how you fit in the ecosystem. If there's a European startup that interfaces somehow with a bank, in the past they wouldn't be able to do that. It would be a nightmare to build any kind of integrating technology. If that bank uses token, that new fancy startup that does some sexy consumer-facing thing can easily ping the bank 
to get data. Let's say it's like Mint or QuickBooks, right, in Europe. They could easily do that. But that that new startup, part of what they're doing is paying the bank. I'm making this number up. Five cents per AP. That's probably too high. Five cents per API call. And you're making up something lower than that. I call it two cents per API call. API call. So the bank's making now money that they didn't know they could make in the past. And you're also making a business on it. Is that basically how the model works? Pretty much, yep. Awesome, great. Now, what is the equivalent to PSD2 in the States, or is all of your growth right now happening in Europe? Uh, there isn't an equivalent of PSD2 in the States. PSD2 is a big stick uh, that uh, only affects the banks in Europe. So how do we make PSD2 and, happen for you in the States? Uh, it'll happen by uh, people will want to be compatible with the banks uh, in Europe. And so in the same way the internet was actually forced upon uh, universities, if you weren't on the internet, you didn't get funding from ARPA. And so they actually had to use a stick to get the internet started. But once the internet was started, then you actually have to have a stick to beat people away or, you know, get them off the internet and, you know, come to dinner, whatever. Yeah. Um, and so I think the same thing will happen here is that there's a big stick that causes the European banks to get on board the system. Once that happens, the apps get written, and then the apps only work with European banks. Ooh. So if I want to move money instantly from bank to bank, I have to do European banks. Well, first American bank gets on and says, hey, if you bank with me, you can move money instantly between um, Europe and the United States, between all these European banks in the United States. Ah, then the next U.S. bank says, hey, I'm not going to let him have all the fun. And the whole thing that just snowballs. How did you tell me the story, how you got your first bank? What was that sale process like? Um, you kiss, I guess. <laughs> um, did you bribe, you, did you bribe somebody, Steve? No, no. <laughs> but, but, um, you know, the old story is, you know, you kiss a lot of frogs and you find a prince. And so, um, I, um, in our case, we talked to a lot of banks. You did a lot of making uh, out is what you're telling me. We talked to a lot of banks and some banks are more forward thinking and more aggressive than other banks. And so those are the ones that we paid attention to. And uh, so, um, you know, Fedor was one of the first and, and also OP Bank in, in Finland. How many banks are you uh, integrated with movers. today? I'm sorry, how many banks are we what? integrated with today? Um, it's pretty small number. Like five? Um, we're... Yeah, it's it's on that order. Okay. Um, but um, it the, the deadline isn't until six months from now, and banks tend to like um, uh, take Wait a long to the time last minute. To, to make decisions. Yep. Okay. So five banks say, and then real quick, give me an insight to your team. How many how many team members are you at? So we have twenty five people. They're split between uh, London and San Francisco. Okay. Where are you? I'm in London right now. Oh, very but cool. But I'm normally based in San Francisco. Many of you listening right now don't have time to listen to every B2B SaaS CEO that I've interviewed. If you want to get access to the database I've created with year-over-year -year growth rates, customer accounts, margins, and many, many other data uh, metrics and data points, you can go to getlatka.com. Here's the thing, though. This that database, I keep it to myself. It's so freaking valuable. And to preserve the quality of the data and make sure that the people that have access to it have a true advantage, I'm only letting 10 companies on each month. So we're full this month, but you can go to getlatka.com to get on the waiting list for next month. And look, there's big people on the waiting list. I mean, the biggest VCs you've ever heard of. You've probably heard of them. They're big, private equity, billions and billions under management. So it's an impressive waiting list. Go get on now at getlatka.com. Okay, Top Tribe, I have to tell you, many people go, Nathan, you came out of nowhere. Your website's growing so fast. How'd you do it? The answer is simple. So I use HostGator. I don't know if you guys know that, but I use HostGator. And the reason I do, they have like about 4,500 free templates I can use because I don't code. They've got a great e-commerce plugin, and guys, I bug the heck out of their support. They've got 24-7 support, which I love. So what I've done is I've worked with them. You guys know I make great deals. If you go to HostGator.com forward slash Nathan, you can sign Sign up, get your own domain for 30% off and a 45-day money-back guarantee. Okay, again, I make great deals for you guys. Go to hostgator.com forward slash Nathan to grab that now. All right, Steve, let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? <laughs> this is easy, um, easy stuff. Uh, you know, I, I really liked uh, Richard Branson's uh, uh, Like a Virgin. Number? Uh, he has a... 
No, <laughs> number two, is there a CEO that you're following or studying? Um, big fan of uh, Elon Musk. I think he's awesome. Number three, is there a favorite online tool you have, like Acuity Scheduling? Um, favorite online tool. I think my my favorite tool uh, that I use all the time is um, uh, is is an add on uh, to uh, uh, to Outlook that enables me to. It's called uh, um, Simply File. Simply File. And it allows, yeah, it allows me to. Um, if I'm looking at a message, I can type in the name of the folder mm -hmm. and um, it shows me the matches and I just click the folder and it's, I've got 5,000 folders. It, we all, so. we all do. Right. Number four, uh, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Uh, nowadays I've been getting about uh, six and a half. Okay. And what's your situa uh, situation? Married, single, you have kids? I am married with children. I have three uh, wonderful girls. Oh, wow. Okay. So three kids and Steve, how old are you? I'm 60. I'm about to ask for your social security number. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> to last question. Take us back 40 years, Steve. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? Oh, wow. Um, huh. Jeez. Um, I, well, I was an, I was an entrepreneur, um, at age 20. So I think it would be, just to hire, hire really good, strong, uh, experienced people. There you the go. There you go. success. Hard, hard work and, and luck. Hard work and luck. Steve just gave it to you guys. Hard work, luck, hire the right people. He's been a part of many, many high-tech companies, two with multi-billion dollar valuations, seven really high-tech companies, now taking a bet on this token space, really taking advantage of the stick that was applied specifically to European banks with a deadline coming up in six months called PSD2. His token approach allows banks to basically not only monetize API calls, but really bring themselves into the 21st century. He also obviously makes a cut of that. The more banks that use them, the more API calls, the more money he makes. They raised uh, over $15 million, team of 20 folks between San Francisco and London. Four or five banks integrated so far. That number is increasing rapidly, rapidly, though, as European banks look to comply with these new laws. Steve, thank you for taking us to the top. Sure. If you enjoyed Steve today, go back and listen to James yesterday. 4,000 developers pay James to catch bugs, and James has raised $9.5 million. So what's the product?